Okay. Because I tend to think of this problem in terms of visual solution rather than a mathematical one. Right. In other words, I, I don't draw up any equations and see which one is bigger. Uh, right. The question is, is that if I change that to, if, if that's an equilateral triangle, then there's only one way I can change it. Well, there's no ways that I can change it without changing the area or the length of AB. Okay. In other words, if I, you know, let me take a screenshot of it. If I change, whoops, hold on. Didn't do it. There we go. If I change this equilateral triangle, I have to do it this way. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. Bless you. <laughs> Sneezing threes usually. Uh, okay, but if I change the equilateral triangle, then it changes AD and it changes the area. Right. But proportionally. In other words, I cannot change that equilateral triangle without changing AB. Correct. And so that is why that is sufficient. The fact that that's an equilateral triangle is enough. But with the isosceles... So I guess, can, I, can I interrupt a minute? I'm uh -huh. sorry. Uh -huh. When you say it's sufficient, uh -huh. meaning... I could determine the area of the triangle just based on the fact that that's an equilateral. Okay, that's what I thought. All right. Mm -hmm. Not quite sure how I would do it, but I'm comfortable that I can. I wish I could explain that concept a little bit better. Um, if, whereas if we look at the isosceles triangle, they're saying that there is a second way to make that isosceles. In other words, that's the same as BD. And that does not change the area of the triangle. Yes, it does. Yeah, it does. Yes, it does, because the new height becomes that height instead of BC. Besides that, it, it's particularly difficult to solve a problem graphically when they don't draw it right. properly. In other words, how is this an isosceles triangle? It, it's got to be that side and that side, right? Right. I mean, there's no way that this other side, that's, op, that's opposite an obtuse angle. So this third side, AB, is clearly the longest side. Yes. So if that's isosceles, then AD has to be equal to BD. Right. But they said that it was not B. Ah, here's the way they're going to redraw it. There we go. Now, that side is still equal to that side. This does not change. So what I've done is drawn a different isosceles triangle and changed the area. Right. Drastically. Therefore, knowing that that is an isosceles triangle is not enough to know the area. 
Clearly, I have two different isosceles triangles. That's one, and my black one is the other one. And I've got two different areas. Right. And the difference between that, that perspective is actually a little easier to understand, I think. In other words, here I can clearly see that I changed the area, even though I still have an isosceles triangle, and I haven't changed that value. Mm -hmm. With the equilateral triangle, I cannot make a different equilateral triangle without changing that side AB. If I try to make it like that, then AB changes. It becomes that. And I've changed the area. So I can't quite define why to me that tells me that that equilateral triangle is enough to know that's all I need to determine the area. If I know side AB, um, you know, if we, if we actually attempted to solve it, we probably could make this a little more mathematical. That's an equilateral triangle. All of those are true. That's 90 degrees. So it'll be 45. 45, 45, that doesn't oh, equal 180. That's, that's 90, so each of those is 60, 60, 60. That makes that a 30, 60, 90 triangle. I can now solve for that side and the area. Right. Just using not, 30, 30, even, not even a trick, using the 30, 60, 90 right triangle proportions. So the fact that I can solve for X means I can solve for the area of the triangle just knowing that is an equilateral triangle. Well, the same does not apply to the isosceles triangle, which actually doesn't really need any further explanation. I think you see why the isosceles yeah. triangle is not enough. Yeah, right. what's, what's more difficult is proving that the equilateral does and really, the way you have to, you should prove it is the way I just did. Figure out what okay. it is. If I can figure out what it is based on the fact that that's equilateral, then that's sufficient. And okay. I can. So, all Arithmetic sequences, which this is one of. There are two types of sequences that you're liable to have to know. One is arithmetic, the other might be geometric, although we have okay. not gotten into a geometric sequence yet. Arithmetic sequences are things like 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. Yeah, the five, same number is added to each. Exactly. There is a common difference. Okay? Right. Geometric sequence, just FYI, even if we don't ever have to run into it, it's 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, where every number is a multiple of the previous number. Right. So that's the difference. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's erase the geometric, because like I said, until we actually run into a problem, I don't really want to confuse you with it. They don't even call this an arithmetic sequence, but that's what it is. First term is equal to the preceding term plus the constant C. It doesn't always have to be a 2. It could be a 3. In other words, I could have mm -hmm. 2, 5, 8, 11. And it doesn't always have to start with a positive number. I could have a negative number. Minus 3, 0, 3, 6, 9. All of those are arithmetic sequences. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this actually is a fairly simple problem. 
let's see if we can come up with a sequence where the first, third, and fifth term add to 27. If we can, the rest will be a piece of cake. So let's try a few numbers. Let's try 3, uh, 8, and 13. What does that add to? That adds to 24. Well, wow. If that adds to 24, then 4, 9, and 14, that adds to 27. How did you know that? <laughs> Well, because that added to 24, and I knew that if I increased each one of them by one, it would add That'll give three, you three more. Three to right. the total. Okay. Um, <laughs> the funny thing about it is, is that those were You add five to four, you get nine, and five to nine, you get 14. So that's a that's an arithmetic sequence. But, but the numbers themselves are one, three, and five. Right. That, in other words, exactly, exactly. So what that, if it's two point four? The reason this sequence doesn't work from beginning to end is because I now can't take half. In other words, I want to be able to take half. Right. And these have to be integers. So 4 as the first term, 9 as the third term, and 14 as the next term aren't going to work. Does it say that they have to be integers? Well, they do in sequences. This is called discrete oh. mathematics, and they always are integers. Whenever you're talking about okay. arithmetic series sequences, uh, geometric power series, they're all integers. Um, okay. it's actually a separate branch of mathematics called discrete mathematics and discrete means everything's an end. Okay. Um, so that sequence doesn't work. The one, so what we're going to need is an even number added to everything. Because then I'll be able to take half of it to find a sub 2 and a sub 4. Oh, okay. So, but it's an odd number. Well, hold on. I don't know how I came up with this, but I came up with it fairly easily. As the first, third, and fifth terms. Those add to 27. Yes. Furthermore, a sub 2 would be 5, correct? Mm -hmm. And a sub 4 would be 13. In other words, this is going to have a common... Okay, difference. yeah, that works. And that does work. So a sub 2 plus a sub 4 is 18. Okay, I get it. Okay, and there's probably a more sophisticated way to do this. Uh, I could teach you about the nth term formula, but I honestly think this might be the easiest way. And oddly enough, this was when I was looking at this earlier, that was my first choice. And, and then I decided when I was going to teach, talk to you about it, I would see if I could just come up with a different starting number and see what happened. And I was a little shocked when I <laughs> saw that four, 9 and 14 also add to 27. But these <laughs> cannot be the first, third, and fifth term of a sequence because of this requirement that all terms right. are integers. So essentially, I just have to plug in numbers. Yeah. I okay. think that's the easiest way to, to do it. And a logical mm -hmm. story place is one. Uh, even those sequences don't have to start at one. They, they, I could have had minus three. In fact, I'm not sure, but if I add 10, that's seven. Uh, that's an even number. That would work. Add 10 more. That totals 21. So that's not going to work. In other words, it has to be 
If it's not 27, it has to be three less or three more. It has to be divisible by three uh, if it's a different set of numbers. Not sure there's what? only one answer here. There might be multiple answers. I might have been able to find a different sequence that totaled 27, and I would still have an a sub 2 and an a sub 4 that were integer numbers. Mm -hmm. But it didn't say write all of them, because if there's more than one, then there are undoubtedly an infinite number, not right. to be just two. There could could actually be an infinite number. So um, I don't know for sure. All right, let's go to the next one. This is a good problem here. Got to be careful here. 21 days for 15 people. First time I looked at it, I said, well, that's 1.4 days per person. Right? Right. But so nine people multiply that by nine and you'd have your answer. But that's not correct. That is looking at it entirely the wrong way. Hmm. What we have to do is we have to realize that it's not just a ratio. As the number of people go down, the numerator's got to go up. Right? If you're on a desert island, there's 50. Oh, right, right, people. because there's going to be more days then. Aha. Uh -huh. In other words, it's the answer has got to be greater than 21. Right. Which all four, all five of these answers are greater than 21. Right. But here's the real way to me, the easiest way to see this solution. First of all, if I only had five people, how many days would it be? Well, There are seven days in a week. Well, no, just the number of days, not the number of weeks. Um, in other words, if I had a third as many people, then it's going to last three, three times as much, right? If I only had five people instead of 15, I'm going to get 63 days worth of water. Oh, okay, right. Okay. So let's take the next logical step and see how much, and this really, to me, is the definitive way to, to think about it. If I had one person, how much water would I have? Or how many days water would I have? Um... So, I have no idea how to figure that out. Multiply 21 by 15. In other words, if I am reducing the population by a factor of 15, then I am increasing the water supply by a factor of 15. What's 15 times 21? Um... Like I said, I don't have my... Do you have any calculator? Um, <laughs> let me see. Hold on. I can do it on mine, but I think it, it actually is more helpful to you if you do it on yours. Well, I changed my password with the iPhones, and I had deleted my app because I had no... No uh, storage. For, for today, let me just do it. Uh, Thank you. Times <laughs> and I forgot my password, so I'm in trouble. Uh, that's all right. Okay, so <laughs> if I had one person, I'd multiply the number of days by 15. You, you get that, right? 
15 times 21. So if I had one person only, I'd have 315 days worth of water. Moral of the story is kill all the people. No, sorry. <laughs> Actually, I'm sure that that is probably how. So you multiplied by 15 because why? Because I'm reducing the number of people by a factor of 15. If I go from 15 down to 1, I've decreased the number of people by a factor of 15. Therefore, I've increased the days, the water supply by a factor. By a factor of 15, okay. And when I went now down I to it. five people, I decreased the number of people by two-thirds. Therefore, my, or not by two-thirds, by one-third. And therefore, my and water supply by three. went up by three. Mm -hmm. The reciprocal of that. Okay. Now I understand. Okay. So now I have one person. Well, if I start adding people, let's say I add and turn it into three people, then I'm going to divide that number by three. Correct? So divide it by nine? Exactly. Gives you 35. Okay, I understand now. Okay. All right, let's go to your second test. Or, no, sorry, the same first test, but a different section. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Hold. Now, do you know the setup of the GRE math to know if there's a difference between section one and section two? I do not. Uh, I do not, no. Okay. Just because you're my first familiarity with the new GRE. Got it. Uh, I did quite a bit of tutoring on the GRE back when it was the old GRE. But mm -hmm. from what I've seen so far, they appear to be similar. In other words, these uh, quantitative comparison questions that we're yes. about to do, they're, they're very similar to the quantitative comparison questions we did in the other test. That one also started out with like 10 or 8 questions that you had to compare quantity A to quantity B. Um, I haven't detected a difference yet. Maybe if we get to a second practice test, I might notice something between the two sections, but at this point I haven't. Okay. okay. I'm making a guess that for number one, quantity A is bigger than quantity B. Um, Yeah, but let's go through the process because actually I don't remember. I, I did this, but I don't remember which answer I got. I just remember how I did it. Okay. If you have point, oops, hold on. And this could be important because sometimes it goes in the opposite direction of the way you think it's going to go. Um. If I have 0.93, and here the units are very helpful, pesos per $1. They want to know the dollar value of one peso. Oh, I see. Okay. So I really have to reciprocate these in order to get the dollar value of one peso. In other words, I'm going to have one dollar, just turn it upside down, per 93 pesos, and both of those are true statements. That is every bit mm -hmm. as true as this. It's just mm -hmm. this way allows me to solve the problem a little bit easier, because now if you divide one by 0.93, you get 1.07. So this one gives you 1.07 
dollars per one peso. I should have left my units the same here. Let's write it like that. In other words, these two are also the same. Right. Okay. Now let's go over and do the same thing with the shilling. We got 30, and we can just approximate this, 30 shillings per $1, which is $1 per 32 shillings. And they want to know how much one shilling is. Well, one divided by 32 is like, three cents per one shilling. Well, this is a dollar seven per one peso. This is three cents per one shilling. Quantity A. And that was your first guess, right? Yep. So you were doing it right. You, you were realizing that the smaller this number over here, the bigger the reciprocal was going to be. And I just know from traveling abroad uh, that... Yes, I was just going to uh, discuss that. that I, this also suggests you've traveled quite a bit and dealt with currency. Yeah. <laughs> currency. Trying to figure out how many euros something is to the dollar. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. All right. Let's look at the next one. And I'm sorry if the things didn't come out very well. <laughs> they're actually very, they're fine. They, as long as I can read them, that's all that really matters. And these actually are, are fairly clear. Do you take these with a iPhone? No, these are all iPad. Oh, iPad pictures. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, I'm having storage issues on my iPhone. Oh, really? Okay. Um, bet you have a lot of pictures on. Although those are stored in the cloud, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think the only storage uh, that's important is on how many apps you're you can put on there. Because I believe most of the data is stored in the cloud. Anyway, yeah. Let's look at number two. What possible values can K be? Can K be nine? Hold on a minute. What page is that again? Don't, I'm having a hard time seeing that in the actual picture there. Really? I can expand it a little bit if it helps. That might help. What's that? Yes, that will help. Okay, here, let me expand it. Whoops. Probably not that much. Huh? There, how about that? Unfortunately, it makes it okay, look... Okay, that's work. perfect. Okay, cool. Let me take a picture of that. So, according to this information they give us, what are... There's only 10 digits. What can K be? Can it be 9? Hold on. K is a digit in the decimal. We know that one. And it's point, less than 1.33. Yeah, that's the key part. And that mm -hmm. tells you what K can be. In other words, obviously K can't be 9. Because 1.39 would not be less than 1.33. K. So if it's less K than 1.33, does that mean K cannot be 3? That's correct. Okay. Because it has to be less than 1.33. And this can only be presumed to be a 0. So 1.335 would not be less than 1.33. So K cannot be above, cannot be 3 or above, which leaves three possibilities. Wait a minute. 1.3K5 is less than 1.330? Uh-huh. 
That's what this says. So it could be a zero, one, or two? Exactly. Zero, one, or two are the three possible values for K. Now, which is bigger, A or B? Well, we can't definitively say, can we? Exactly. That's the answer, D. Okay. Yeah. No, that one, whenever you get, you know, don't, uh, don't try to make it one of them bigger than the other. A quarter of these are going to be indeterminable. So okay. You see it. It doesn't necessarily mean it's wrong. Um, okay. This one I'm going to have to. You can make that smaller. <laughs> just a little bit. Yeah. And even smaller. I just had a hard time seeing K. Yeah. Hold on a second. I need this to go up and I can't get access. There we go. Perfect. Can you see that? Yes. Okay. Now I can take a picture of it, which reduces it just a tiny bit, but should still be okay. Yep. I'm just going to make a guess that they are equal. Okay. Uh, which is longer, AC or AB? Um, AB is the diameter of the circle, AC is not. In other words, the center of that circle is right there. Yeah. So I'm thinking that AC is not as long as AB. Correct. The diameter is always the longest part on any circle. In any line that does not go through the diameter is not going to be as big as the diameter. Correct. Which is longer, AB or AD? Same thing. Correct. So now what's your average length of AC and AD going to be? Less than, equal to, or greater than AB? Remember your average is you get AC plus AD divided by two. Well, they're already shorter than AB. Correct, so their average has gotta be shorter than AB. So then A is longer. Yes. Okay. I was thinking, I got confused with the average. I was thinking it had some well, you know what I bet you were thinking was the angles. In other words, that is an equivalent angle on both sides. If you were to average those two lines, they would end up being right there. They're, yeah. You average them visually or graphically. Yeah, I think that's what I was doing. And so I can see why you said that. That one was number three, wasn't it? <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay. This quantity is in terms of S. This quantity over here is in terms of T. If I want to, based on that formula, I can define S in terms of T or T in terms of S and substitute. And then I'll be able to compare which one is bigger. Uh-huh. So let's do the easiest thing. Let's solve it for S. <coughs> S is the square root of 10 over T. <coughs> based just going from there to there. Okay. Okay. Now, if I go in, what's S squared if S is that? S squared is pi over 
I mean, the pot square root of 10 over t squared. Okay. So I got square root of 10 over t, that quantity squared. And how you do that is you square top and you square bottom. Which gives you 10 over t squared. They so are, they're equal. They are equal. Um, yeah, I, uh, I was just looking at this a second time to see whether or not negative numbers might have something to do with it. In other words, S and T could be negative if they were both negative. Notice that that has to be a positive number. So either they have to be both positive or they have to be both negative. Right. And either way, S squared is the same and T squared is the same. So that's right. not going to affect anything. So I should always be careful to see if a negative number works? Not necessarily. No, no, the math on this was not... I didn't have to take the square root of anything. In other words, if I had to take the square root of s, then I actually get plus or minus s. Excuse me, if I took the square root, this is actually plus or minus s. But nowhere do I have to do that. In other words, I didn't have to solve an equation by taking the square root of both sides at any point. Up here, I solved for S, just substituted it down there, got the same exact expression. Right. So my question is, when do I know I need to check for negative numbers, and when do I know I don't? You, whenever you take the, let me give you an example. If I have an equation, that I have to solve by taking the square root of both sides, then that's plus or minus five. It's not just okay. five. And that's cool. Right. It's only if I write that, that is five. That's plus five. But okay. if I am solving an equation by taking the both square root of both sides, it's different. That's when your answer always begins plus or minus. And I probably confused you because I said the actual square root of x squared is plus or minus x, and it is. But that answer is the same as this answer. Right. And so we never think about putting the plus or minus on the left side. We only put it on the right side in front of the number. Okay. All right. So if I have to take the square root of both sides in an equation, then I need to worry about the negative numbers? Is that what in you were saying? Answer. What I tell my students is begin your answer with the words plus or minus. Okay. Thank you. Yes. In fact, I'm always harping on students because 95% of my students leave off the plus or minus. I don't think I'm exaggerating. They just automatically don't put it in there. And so I, mm -hmm. I joke with a lot of them, and I wish I had a song that I could teach them. <laughs> you know, like you learn the ABCs by right, exactly. the song, and, and they teach the quadratic formula by making a little song up that you can memorize the song. I wish right. I had a song for when you take the square root of both sides of an equation, begin your answer with the words plus or minus. <laughs> but it doesn't matter how often I tell students that. They'll remember for about 30, 30 minutes, and in the next session, they'll leave it off. <laughs> so it really does need a special way to remember it. I'm right. not sure what it is. I, uh, I'm at a loss as to how to help people remember that. 
I'm actually pretty good at memorizing quite, there's so much memorization involved in math that a lot of times the best thing I can help a student with is just uh, techniques of memorizing numbers, of memorizing things. Not right. numbers, but things. And right. certain tricks to memorizing stuff that are very helpful where instead of having to memorize six things, you can get away with memorizing three things. Exactly. Things like that. So, all right. Three consecutive integers have a sum of minus 84. Now, this is an arithmetic series, but that's neither here nor there. Let's try three consecutive numbers. Two, three, four. That isn't going to work, is it? Should be higher right well they got to be negative in other words they're going to have to be something like negative 25 what's the next one negative 26 uh no negative 24 or negative 23. okay now what is that total that totals negative 72. so we have to go further to the left exactly by a third of that difference. I got to go to the left by four units because I'm going to end up with three numbers that are each four smaller. In other words, minus 29, minus 28, and minus 27. That totals 80 minus 84. Okay. Now, the question is, which quantity is bigger? In other words, they're still trying to trick us. We figured out the three numbers, but you got to be a little careful here. Which is bigger, A or B? Well, negative 29 is bigger. Oh, no, negative 27 is bigger than negative 28. Quantity bigger is minus 28. First of all, the least of the three integers is that one. Oh, okay, right, okay. And which is smaller or which is bigger between minus 28 and minus 29? Minus 28. Always remember that we're looking on a number line. Right, and okay. That's minus 29, I had to see the least. That's okay. minus 28. That is a smaller number than that. Right. Gonna make sure the time doesn't get away from me. I uh, have a four o'clock. <laughs> oh, okay. I got a point, and then I got another hour after that. You uh, want me to put my timer on? No, I think I set mine just because I was worried okay. about going over. So mine will go off. I think at one minute two. All right, in the xy plane, the equation of line k is 3x minus 2y. And they're asking us to say which is bigger, the x-intercept or the y-intercept. Hmm. Well, So 3x minus 2y equals? Zero. Now, when you have an equation of a line, and we know that that's what this is because there's an x, there's a y, there's no squares, there's no square roots. Everything has an exponent of 1 on it. And there's two variables. That is a straight line. OK. If we wanted to, we could put that into y equal mx plus b format. That would certainly tell us our y-intercept. Right. But then we'd have to do more work to solve for our x-intercept. We would have to set that equal to 0 and solve it for the x-intercept. Well, there happens to be a much easier way to solve for your intercepts 
if it's in standard format. Standard format is this, AX plus BY equals C. Well, that's the format this is in. And the reason this becomes easier to graph, in fact, this is the perfect way to find the X and the Y intercepts. Let's talk about the X intercepts. What does the Y value have to be when this line crosses the X axis? Sorry, what? What does the Y value of the coordinate have to be when I cross the X axis? In other words, if I have a line like that, that has uh, some X coordinate, but what's the Y coordinate? The Y coordinate is zero? Always. Whenever you're on the X intercept, Y is zero. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to substitute zero for y and solve for x. Okay. Well, that means 3x is equal to zero, and x has to be equal to zero. So the x-intercept is zero. In other words, this thing doesn't have a y, or it, its x-intercept is zero. Let me just leave it at that for the moment. Now, what is true about X when we're talking about the Y-intercept? If, if I have a line that runs through like that, what is the value of X when I'm talking Y-intercept? Zero. Those two things are well worth remembering. That X-intercepts, Y is zero y-intercepts, x is zero. Well, if I put in zero for x, that goes away, and I got minus 2y equals zero. Well, y has to be zero also. So that is also the y-intercept. So they are equal? Correct. Now, how so the do AX this? plus BY equation that you have up there, uh -huh. that's for, I mean, that's what's that equation for again? You, in standard format, then you can use it the quickest. Here, I, I, I think it's probably worth going over. I don't know if it is or not, but if I didn't know about this little shortcut, for solving for intercepts when it's in standard format. Because not everybody's going to remember that from their high school algebra. But a lot of people do remember y equal mx plus b. Okay? Mm -hmm. Well, if I put this in y equal mx plus b format, I get y equals 3 halves x and b is 0. So that immediately tells me that the y-intercept is zero. That's pretty quick. And now to solve for the x-intercept, I make y zero. So y equals three halves x. Well, that tells me x is also zero. So that's not really that much harder. In fact, it might be easier. Um, but whether it would be easier if there was a number here, if that was 12, then this, the first method, is going to be a lot faster. The AX plus BY equals C? Yes. Because okay. notice that the first method, uh, when I let X equals 0, Y is minus 6. And when I let Y equals 0, X is 4. Problem done and solved. Mm -hmm. Whereas, if I have to do additional work, I get 2y equals minus, or rather, plus 3x minus 12, which means y equals 3 halves x minus 6, which does indeed give me the y-intercept. Mm -hmm. 
of minus 6. But now to get the x-intercept, i got to do a lot of complicated math. i got to set y equals 0 and solve that. Well, the 6 moves over. Now i got to multiply by 2 thirds each side. So I get 4 equals, no, I don't. Uh, yeah. No, four, 6 is not, yes, 6 is 3 halves of 4. Yeah. So I've still figured out my x-intercepts and my y-intercepts, but far more difficult to do it this way here rather than the way I did it using this formula. I did that in my head in two steps, two quick steps. Right. So in this particular problem, it's not going to look like the advantage is all that much because it happens to be equal to zero. But you make that a number, and then all of a sudden this technique is much quicker. Mm -hmm. Not that technique, this technique over here, sorry. Right. Not to confuse you. All right. Actually, you know, this section might be easier. I, I, haven't, I haven't run into a problem yet that gave me much difficulty. Not that I remember running into too many on the other one either, um, at least not these sections. I've, I've never found these quantitative comparisons to be that hard. Um, right. it, it's why I much prefer tutoring the GRE as opposed to the GMAT, because the right. GMAT does not have quantitative comparisons. They have something called data sufficiencies, and those are brutal. Uh, <laughs> not that your test doesn't have some brutal questions. We've seen a few of them that have right. been brutal, but they haven't been in this area of the test. They haven't been no. data comparisons. They come more in the word problems and other type problems they throw at you. Right. Uh, okay. N is a positive integer that is divisible by 6. Well, let's write some. Okay. Always not a bad way to start when they give you a problem like this. Mm -hmm. Don't necessarily try to figure it out algebraically. Just write some numbers down that fit their proposition. Now, the remainder when n is divided by 12. Well, it's the remainder if I divide 6 by 12. The remainder is 6. 12 goes into 6 zero times with a remainder of 6. You with me? Yes. 12 goes into 12, no remainder. Once, no remainders. 12 goes into 18 one time with a remainder of 6. 12 goes into 24 evenly, zero remainder. And you will see that pattern. It'll go 6, 0, 6, 0. So let's just write it down here. 6, 0, 6, 0. Okay. Now the remainder when n is divided by 18. Let's make all of these 18. Well, 18 goes into 6 zero times with an 18 remainder. 18 goes into 12 zero times with a 12 remainder. 18 goes into 18 one time, no remainder. 18 goes into 24 one time with a remainder of 6. So our pattern which is going to be duplicated. In other words, the next one would be 30 divided by 18 gives you a remainder of 12. Uh, and then when I get to 36, I get 0. So actually the pattern appears to be that. And then when I get back to 42, I'm sorry, this remainder here is 6, not 18. Well, 
when you divide 6 by 18, you get 0 with a remainder of 6. Okay. So when I divide 12 by 18, I get 0 with a remainder of 12. So my pattern is 6, 12, 0, 6, 12, 0. Uh-huh. Now, which is bigger? Um, B. Can't tell. Oh, because you don't know which one you're coming up with, right? Right. Um, let's see. Those two remainders were six. This one was zero. This one was 12. This one was six. This one was zero. So notice in this case, the top one is less. In this case, the bottom one is less. Mm -hmm. So therefore, you can't tell. That's all you ever need to do. In other words, if ever you can immediately come up with two solutions that give you one quantity is bigger than the other, and the other solution gives you vice versa, you know the answer is D without any further effort. Right, and our time is up. Yes, it is. Uh, I will go, and I will talk to you. I'll see you Friday. Friday. Okay, thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.